today is one of those special days. Uh, every sermon comes from God around here, whether it be me preaching, Don preaching, Jason preaching, every sermon comes from God. But this is one of those sermons that I, I'm not surprised that our numbers are a little off today because this is one of those sermons that the devil has worked all week to keep you from hearing. Because this is one of those sermons that if you listen and you apply, God will use it to make a profound difference, not only in this life, but the next. And so be warned. A couple of things. Number one, the devil, he's not giving up. He's still going to do everything in his power to distract Brianna from listening to me. Lexi's going to do something. Haley's going to do something. Something's going to happen. And the devil's going to try everything in his power to keep you from listening to what I'm saying because he's not giving up. He's not, he still can win if you're distracted. And also, this is going to be one of those sermons that some of you are going to be disappointed because you, let's just be honest, you come because you enjoy coming here, listen to me, open up a can of whoop, and stomp on people. But this is going to be more teaching than it is preaching. And I always feel like I need to warn that because, again, some of you just want, you just want to come in here and you want me, go get them, Randy, go get them, go get them, rather than saying, oh God, deal with me. And so this is going to be more teaching than it is preaching, but if you'll stay with me, I'm, I promise you, it's going to make a difference. Because here's the thing, I'm concerned for you. The reason why I'm preaching this message today is because I'm concerned that there are people in our room today that you're in trouble. And the sad part is you don't even know you're in trouble. The sad part is you're bebopping through life, you're, you're living your life, and you think everything's copacetic, you think everything's great, and, and, and all the while, you are on a path for destruction. And you're saying, well, Randy, I know I'm saved, I'm, I know I'm a Christian. I wish you would read your Bible, because if you read your Bible, yes, getting saved is great. Yes, being a Christian is awesome, but it, it's just the start it's not the end when you cry out to god and pray and ask him to save you and he comes in and he gives you a new heart new life that's just the beginning and some of you you got your fire insurance you got saved and you're like okay it's on cruise control i'm just going to go through life now i can focus on me now i can focus on what i want to focus on now i can do what i want to do And you're on the path of destruction. You're saying, Randy, why is that? Because of this fact. Please understand this fact. If you don't get this fact, then you've wasted your day today. And that is each of us will be judged for the life we live. Each of us will be judged for the life we live. We are all going to stand before God and be judged for the life we live. Now, it will start with Christians. And this is where I get concerned for some of you. You're, you, before you got saved, you were scared to death of God's judgment. But now that you're saved, you're thinking, okay, who cares? Let me explain something to you. Judgment's going to start with us, Christians. It's going to start with God's household. And it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be good. I was sharing with Victor just this week. A lot of you got this mistaken, impl- in, uh, this mistaken idea that once you die, there's no more sorrow, there's no more pain, there's no more tears, Can I tell you, if you will study your scripture, the no more tears part, if Jesus came back today, it would still be a thousand and seven years before the no more tears part kicks in. And some of you are acting like, well, I'm saved, I know I'm going to heaven, and so... Okay, it really doesn't matter how I live, because Randy's taught me Colossians 2.13 that says, hey, we've all been forgiven, everything's been forgiven, And so nothing matters if everything's been forgiven. I don't think you understand the difference between forgiveness. Just because you've been forgiven doesn't mean that there's not still consequences for the choices in your life. I learned this early on in my ministry. One of my teenage girls got knocked up. She had sex before marriage, and she got knocked up. And she came to me, and we went to the altar, and we prayed, and God forgave her. She woke, she got off the altar and walked away glowing. But guess what? She was still pregnant. And she still spent the next 25 years of her life paying for that mistake. The consequences do not go away just because you've been forgiven. Forgiveness does not mean. There's no consequences. Forgiveness means there's no punishment. There's a difference. And some of you right now, you're thinking, well, I'm saved. No big deal. No, 
Guess what? Judgment starts with us. 1 Corinthians 3.13 says this, The quality of each Christian's life will be seen when the day of Christ exposes it. For on that day, fire will reveal everyone's work. The fire will test it and show its real quality. What's he saying there? He's saying that after you die, as a Christian, I'm talking to Christians here. We're, I'm going to get to you, those of you who are not saved, even though you think you are. But I'm talking to Christians. He's saying that we will stand before God to be judged. We will stand before Christ to be judged. Not for heaven or hell. That's already been decided. We're going to stand before God to be judged, what, for our rewards, but also our heavenly job description. And this is what God's going to do. He's going to take everything that Jessica has done since she's been saved, and he's going to take everything that she's done, he's going to pile it up in a pile, and then he's going to light it on fire. And that which was done right, that which was done in love, that which was done good will stand the test of fire. But everything else that's selfish, everything else that's prideful, everything else that's narcissistic, all those stupid posts you put on Facebook, all those stupid words that you've said, everything that you've done that's wrong, even after you're saved, that's going to be burnt up. And guess what? There's going to be tears that day. But I'm in heaven. I'm in the presence of Jesus. Yeah. By the way, read your Bible. Notice what happens when even the greatest men of old stood before a holy God named Jesus. They dropped through their knees. They wept. They were scared. They played dead. So don't act like standing before Jesus for us is going to be a good thing. We're going to be scared to death because we know. And I'm scared for some of you Christians because you're living like there's not a day of reckoning that's coming. God's going to burn you up. He's going to refine you. And there's going to be great loss. That's why 1 Peter 4, 17 says, it says, judgment must begin with God's household. That's us. But then he goes on. Now we're going to transition to the other judgment that takes place. And if judgment begins with us, talking about Christians, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? Now what he's saying there is judgment will start with Christian, but then it will include everyone else. He's, that's the what terrible fate, what? Awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news. Those are the lost. Those are people who have heard about Jesus, know about Jesus. Like many of you here today who pretend to be saved, you act like you're saved, but you can't even stay focused on God's word for 10 minutes because you have no truth in you. And he says, what terrible fate awaits us? that refuse to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. You see, everyone who's not a Christian will be judged for one thing. What have they done with Jesus? You see, they're not going to be judged for murdering, raping, pillaging. Let me explain something to you. Rejecting Jesus Christ in God's word and in God's mind, the Father, is the very worst thing you can do. I think about it from my perspective. If my son lived a perfect life, and then he died on a cross for you, rose again, went to heaven, and then you looked at that sacrifice, and you looked at that work, and you turned your back on that, you better hope to God Almighty that I ain't God, because I'll burn you down. And if I'm that way, and my limited and flawed love for Joshua, how much more will God the Father be to those who reject what Jesus did that first Easter? He's going to burn you down, but, then he's, but guess what? You ain't going to die. You're going to burn forever and ever and ever and ever. Why? Because of what you didn't do with Jesus. In fact, Matthew 12, 36 says it will be so intense that on Judgment Day, all people will have to give an account of every careless word they say. Think back to this last week. Just this last week. I don't, some of you are old. I'm not going to ask you to go back decades. Just about this, this week. All those stupid things that you've said, you're going to be judged for. 
And I don't know about you, but there's going to be so much regret in my heart. You see it described in 1 Corinthians 3.15. It says, if the work is burned up, the person will suffer great loss. That phrase, great loss, is another word, it's our word for regret. I don't know about you, but this has been hitting me lately. I told Jason, I don't know if I can even preach this message today because this has just been such a, a burden on me. Because I, 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 I'm not even going to talk about Randy pre-20. I've talked about him enough. He was an idiot. He woke up every day looking for a way to screw somebody. I'm just talking about Randy in his 20s. I've got so much regret there. Randy in his 30s. I've got so much regret. Randy in his 40s. So much regret. And I've only been 50 a year, October. And I've already screwed this decade up. And I have been so tempted to despair. Because I've done the best I freaking know how since I was 20. And yet I know that if I died today and I stood before Jesus, I would suffer so much loss. I would have so much regret. Now here's the thing, before we forget. I'm a Christian. And that's how bad this is going to go for me. How bad do you think it's going to go for those who have rejected Christ, who refused to get saved, who've gone through all the motions, said all the words, but never have received that new heart, become a new person? Some of you are the same person that I met 13 years ago, and yet you're trying to tell me you're saved? Some of you have listened to 10 years of messages designed to get your attention, to change your heart, and yet you're still the same? You just keep a changing from one addiction to another addiction to another addiction to another addiction, and then you try to convince me that you're saved? Where does the new heart finally kick in for you? I'll tell you when it kicks in, when you get saved. But if it's going to be this bad for Randy Hand, how bad is it going to be for those who reject Christ? Because I know God loves me. And I am so concerned for us. Because we just keep bebopping through life. Acting like nothing matters. But if it ever gets you, you're going to be like me. You're going to be like, Lord, what? Is there any hope? And then this week, praise him. He gave me this truth. This is a, an amazing promise that I don't even think that if he would have told it to me, 10 years ago, I, I would have had the faith to believe. I'm still wondering if I have the faith to believe it now, but let me go ahead and share with you the truth. Maybe God will, will grace us faith to believe this truth, and the truth is this. God can enable us to live a life without regrets. That's a truth based upon what? 1 Corinthians 1, 8 says this. By the way, any, be, be careful, because usually when we're reading a book in the, in the new part of the Bible, we kind of blow through the first chapter. Well, this promise was hidden in first corinthians chapter one that maybe you've read it a hundred times but you never heard it and this is what he says in first corinthians 1 8 he says god will also strengthen you to the end he's talking about that judgment thing again so that you will be blameless in the day of our lord jesus christ what's he saying there he's saying that i can stand before god blameless i can be judged blameless what an amazing promise what an incredible promise, one that I'm just telling you, you best ask now, oh God, give me the faith to believe this promise. Because if you don't have the faith to believe this promise, then the rest of this message is not going to help you. But if we believe him, if we faith him, then from this moment on, we can, when, when, I, I get it, the first 50 years of Randy's life is going to be rough. I'm going to be sitting there crying because all this crap that I've done is going to be burned up. But maybe 50 to 80, maybe just a little bit gets burned up and the rest stand the test. You see, I, I know I can live, by the way, I know I can live blameless with you. 
but he just said I can live blameless with him. Do you believe that? It's a, that's a big promise. And so what do we do? Well, Philippians 2.15 takes it a step further. It says, you may be innocent and pure as God's blameless children. There's that word again. Who live in a world of corrupt and sinful people. He's saying that we can be blameless. But notice the key words there, that key phrase. He said, maybe. There's no guarantee. Just because Todd wakes up and decides to be Todd doesn't mean he's going to stand before God blameless. That somehow, some way, we have to partner with God to have no regrets. And so let's just be real clear here. We can't do anything about yesterday. I can't. If I could, I would. But we can change tomorrow. And each day that God lets me live, I, it's one more day that I can live without regret. So how do we do that? Well, read with me, if you would, a strange little passage in 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, it's a strange little passage. It, it begins with verse 15. And we're going to unpack it. I'm going to teach you. You're going to understand it. So just because you don't understand it when you first hear it, just be patient. And this is what he says. In verse 15 of John 2, 1 John 2, he says, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers what? Only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone, here's the hope, anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. You're saying, okay, Randy, how does that help me live a life with no regrets? How do I get to the point where I can be blameless and, and have no regrets when I stand before God? Well, we see first thing we need to do from our verses is we need to guard our heart. You need to guard your heart. If you're going to live a life without regret, moving forward, again, I can't change yesterday, but if you, as you move forward, you want to live a life without regret, you need to guard your heart. You're saying, Randy, how did you get that out of that first John passage? Well, read it with me. Go back to verse 15. He says, do not love this world nor the things it offers you, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Now, what does he mean by world? Is he talking about the circle? Is he talking about earth? No. Sometimes he does. You could usually tell by the context. Let me give you the definition of world, because some of you have heard about the world all your life, but you don't know what it is. Here's the definition of the world. It is a culture's way of thinking. It's a mindset that is against God, the Bible, and God's people. When, it, when you hear the world in the Bible, it is a culture's way of thinking that is against God, the Bible, and God's people. You'll see it, by the way, expressed through their entertainment, music, television, movies. You'll see it also through their education. You'll see it also, this worldly mindset, this mindset through our government. But it... Those are the things that communicate values that go against God. Let me give you an example. Our culture, our world, constantly tells us and our children and our grandchildren, whatever it takes, be happy. Just be happy. By the way, there is nothing further from the Bible than that. There is nowhere in the Bible that I see that my job is to wake up every morning to be happy. But what do you do? You hear it in our music. You hear it in our television. It, by the way, we've gotten so screwed up with this now. This is what our world is saying. If cutting off your penis, boy, and pretending you have a vagina makes you happy, then you be you. Now, is there anything further against the Scripture, God's Word, the God who knit us in our, fam our, our mother's belly? Is there anything more against that than God's people than that? But that's the world. That's what we see. By the way, your kids are getting it at school. Your kids are getting it in all, all of the culture. It's that mindset that goes against God and the Bible. Now you're saying, well, Randy, where does this kind of thinking come from? Well, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says this. Satan is the God of this world. James 3, 15, Jesus' brother says, that kind of wisdom, worldly wisdom, doesn't come from above. It belongs to this world. It is self-centered and demonic. Right? So where does it come from? 
the devil and his demons. That's why James goes on to say in 127, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means this, refusing to let the world corrupt you. You're saying, Randy, really? Now, evidently, if you read Scripture, that the world's way of thinking is so attractive, it's so enticing, that Christians will reject God's mindset, reject God's worldview, reject the Bible, and take up and believe and think like the world. Here's the problem. It leads to their destruction. Evidently, for example... There is nowhere in Scripture where it says, I'm supposed to worship women. But this world constantly tells me stupid things like this. If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. What is that saying? That the God of my house should be mama. Are you freaking kidding me? Tell me where that is in Scripture. Tell me where it says that Jonathan should say, screw God, screw everything else. I'm only going to do what Mama Patty said. Oh, that's not what Scripture says. But Jonathan has been taught that all of his life. That women are to be elevated, to be idolized, even though Scripture clearly teaches that, guess what? Susie's sin nature is just as bad as mine. And so evidently this worldly mindset is so enticing that Christians will be tempted to follow it to the destruction. That's why 2 Peter 2.20 says this, When people escape the wickedness, talking about Christians, of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then get tangled up and enslaved by the world again, they are worse off than before. Did you hear that? I don't think y'all understand. Again, y'all, you get saved... And you just act like everything's okay. Megan's probably already been tempted to believe that, hey, I got saved recently. Everything's cool. No. You do realize sometimes getting saved means more heartache and pain because if you allow yourself to go back into your sin, go back into your destruction, go back into your lust, then guess what? The Bible says you're actually worse off than before you got saved. You see, not all... (laughs) It's not always a blessing to become a Christian. Not in the short term. And so evidently this world is so enticing that we'll end up worse off than we were before if we believe what it says. So how do we avoid this? Now we get to what I was saying. Proverbs 4.23 says this, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Now what does that mean? We talk about that all the time. We tell our kids, guard your heart, guard your heart, guard your heart. What does it mean to guard your heart? Well, that's why I took you to 1 John chapter 2. He breaks it down for us. He talks about how the world messes with our heart. You're saying, what do you mean? Well, if we're going to guard our heart, write this down, we've got to guard our appetites. We've got to guard our appetites. Now, what are our appetites? They are our God-given desire for drink, food, and sex. Every human being was given by God an appetite, a desire for drink, food, and sex. By the way, that's in order. Your greatest appetite is drink. You cannot last longer than seven days without drinking something or you will die. Your next appetite is for food. You can't last much more than 40 days without food and you're going to die. Some of you are living proof that you can go a long time without sex and not die. I don't, don't, don't tell me that, teenager. I get it. I, I used to use that line, too. Well, it's, God, yeah, I'm going to die. No, nope, you're not going to die, okay? There's scientific evidence to suggest that you won't, okay? You may feel like it. Well, notice what 1 John 2, 16 says. It says, the world, only, the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. So what's he saying there? He's saying that as we watch TV, as we go to the movie, as we listen to the radio, as we listen to the government, as we go to school, as, we get, as we're educated, as we read the books, the world is going to be constantly tempting us and playing on our weaknesses. You see, the devil knows your weaknesses. He knows those things that trip you up. I know, for example, this is, I know you're going to laugh at me, but this was something I struggled with for years. I'd be sitting at home. Y'all want to know why I was a, why I was a short, fat kid? I would be sitting... At home, perfectly content, had had all the food that I needed to have, right? Eaten well. 
be watching TV around 10 o'clock p.m. And Pizza Hut would have a commercial <laughs> on the TV. And I'd be going, hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking I want me a pizza. And both, both wives, by the way, they were, they were both consistent. You don't need a pizza at 10 p.m. I'm sitting there going, and all I could think about was that pizza. And so guess what Randy would do? He'd get off his happy tail, he'd get in his car, and he'd go get him a pizza. At 10 o'clock at night! By the way, where do you think all of those fat and carbs and stuff went? It didn't build great chest muscles, I can go ahead and promise you that. But the world knows my weaknesses. By the way, notice every commercial is going to play on one of those appetites in you. Get you to drink something you don't need to drink. Eat something you don't need to eat. Have sex with somebody you're not supposed to have sex with, right? And that's why 1 Peter 2.11 says, Dear friends, I urge you to keep away from fleshly desires that do battle against the soul. you got to see, see, it's not just trying to harm your body. They're just trying to harm your soul. The world is out to destroy your soul. So how do we keep away from those fleshly desires? Ready? Write this down. First, Job 1.10. Job 1.10 says this, You, God, have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and all that he has. If you want to guard your appetite, you've got to pray that hedge of protection around your relationships, your marriage, your family, your children, your home. But by the way, not only do you need to pray that, some of you need to stop bringing the mess into your house. You want to know why it's hard for me to sin now? Because dad got me and Jennifer buys groceries. And some of you have noticed that Jennifer's been the same size since she was 16. There's a reason for that. Because when her jeans get a little bit snug, she stops eating. And guess what happens? Since she buys the groceries, when she stops eating, I stop eating. <laughs> like, dang it, woman, buy you some bigger jeans. <laughs> it's hard to sin in my house. Why? There's, there's nothing to sin with. Right? By the way, why did I get rid of cable TV? Because I didn't need 150 channels to tempt me. Some of you need to quit. You are, you are paying, begging, asking the world and the devil to destroy your appetites. And you're paying for it. So we need to partner with God to build a fence through prayer, a fence through choices, a fence. Right? I'll tell you the biggest thing I wish some of you would get. You want to know how you put a fence around your marriage? Say this, guys and girls can't be friends. I have yet to counsel somebody that cheated on their spouse that wasn't a friend first. So Jennifer and I decided early on, because of what I've been through, that we were going to put that fence around our marriage because we didn't want nobody else in our marriage bed. So the first thing we've got to do, we gotta, if we're going to guard our hearts, we've got to guard our appetites. But notice, secondly, we got to guard our attractions. we got to guard our attractions. What do I mean by attractions? Those temptations that lead us away from God. Those temptations that lead us away from God. 1 John 2, 16 says this, The world offers only a craving for everything we see. What's he saying there? He's saying we all got our thing. Those things that tempt us to idolatry. Those things that tempt us to replace God in our life. For example, you know, God woke me up the other night. One of these days, I've got I, I to share that testimony. And I, I'm going to get Ben to come in here and share a testimony because two of your elders have had their butts handed to them lately by God. God attacked us because of idols in our life. And he about killed us. The other night, God woke me up at 3 o'clock. I'm... My brain is just on fire. My body is hurting. It's like somebody stabbing me in my hip. He sends me downstairs. By the way, this is only part of the story. He sends me downstairs, and I'm like, okay, God, what do you want? What do you want? And this is what he said. He said, Randy, I told you to be content with your car. For those of you who don't know, I love cars. <laughs> Jennifer says all the time she is so thankful that I am more faithful to her than I am to vehicles because about once a year I like to buy a car. And usually six weeks after I buy said car, I'm looking for another car. And God had told me 
about two months ago, Randy be content. And I was like, okay. But then Jennifer said, I'll blame her. <laughs> Jennifer said, Randy, you know, I always liked you in an SUV. I think you look good in an SUV. And I'm like, mm, I think I look good in an SUV too. Well, that's of the Lord. Because if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy, right? So I begin, even though God has said, be content. By the way, I got a freaking Honda Accord. There ain't no better car in the world. I'm sorry to tell you the Camry people. Just keep trying. But I got, I've got the best car. Really? What? I, 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 ah! But I, let Je- I use Jennifer as an excuse to start looking at cars. And guess what happens when Randy looks at cars? He don't read his Bible enough. He don't pray enough. He's like this on his phone. Instead of spending time with my family, when I'm looking at cars, I go to the bathroom, turn the fan on, let them know I'm doing something, and then I look at cars. You see, the devil knows my thing. The world knows my thing. And guess what? The world's so good at this, that every single ad on Facebook and Instagram or what? <laughs> this is what 2 Peter 1, 4 commands us to what? Escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So how do we do that? 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. You see, if we're going to guard our attractions, you know what your temptations are. You know what tunes you up and turns you on. Then we've got to be brutal. When a thought comes in my head about a car right now, because I don't want him to whoop my tail no more, I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I I, I literally treat, I'm like, God, I'm going to be as faithful to my Honda Accord as I am Jennifer. I don't look at women at Walmart. I don't look at women driving down the road. And so I'm, I'm literally going, as I'm driving, I'm like, no, nope, don't look at that SUV. No. Nope. <laughs> then I had to go through all my Facebook account and my Instagram accounts and hit remove ad. Why? I mean, that stuff's like porn for me. I love cars. You see, some of you need to be brutal. You know your weaknesses. You know what they are. And you know how the world loves to play on your weaknesses. And you've got to be brutal to take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. But notice one last thing. If we're going to guard our heart, we've got to guard our arrogance. We've got to guard our arrogance. If we're going to guard our heart, we've got to guard our arrogance. What do I mean by arrogance? It's those things that make us cocky. 1 John 2.16 says this. The world offers only pride in our achievements and possessions. I don't know about you, but as I live in this world that we live in, that's under the control of Satan. Remember, Satan's the God of this world. I am constantly tempted to pride. <laughs> Tammy and I laugh about this all the time because we both made a commitment to pray more. And then we get cocky over the fact that I pray more than you. <laughs> really? I'm going to turn prayer into something? Oh, how desperately wicked my heart is. I don't know about you, I'm in the gym. Now, if there's one place that I should be humble, it should be the gym. Because I am an uncoordinated white guy that's 50 years old, that's bald, and I sag in places. If there's one place that I should be humble, but no. I'm walking through the gym going, well, I ain't on my phone. I am, you know, because you know, there's, there's people that sit on the piece of equipment for 30 minutes and don't do anything because they're on their phone. And I'm walking through the gym going, well, I'm better than you. I'm better than you. I'm better than you. Life is a constant temptation to cockiness and arrogance. Well, what's the problem with that? Are you hearing me? God says in Jeremiah 50, 31, I am your enemy, you arrogant people. Your day of reckoning has arrived, the day when I will punish you. By the way, he's talking to his children there. So when I allow myself to be arrogant, I allow myself to get cocky, God turns from being a loving heavenly father to my enemy. By the way, those of you who had good dads in your life, you know what I'm talking about. My dad was loving. Those hands, were they would cut my face. They would love me. They would care for me. But the second I got in rebellion, 
my dad would turn. And he went from being somebody I wanted to be around to where I was scared crapless of him. Why? Because sin caused my dad to become my enemy until I repented. Same is true with our Heavenly Father. The second you let pride and arrogance and cockiness come into your heart and you don't immediately get rid of it, he goes to be your enemy. And then are we beginning to realize why our life's not where it should be? Are we beginning to realize why we're, not, we're, we're more cursed than we are blessed? So what do we do? Beautiful verse. I shared it with Chris and Katie yesterday. It's a beautiful verse. Some of you need to memorize it. Hebrews 9.14. It said, The blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can serve the living God. Hebrews 9.14. Life verse right there. Yes, take a picture of it like Debbie. This is what we do. We say, Oh God, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ down upon my heart. Cleanse it of all pride and arrogance starts with us but then we don't stop there as i'm walking into that gym you know that place that constantly tempts me to pride this is what i'm praying oh god i plead the blood of jesus christ down upon my workouts may i work out with no regrets as i'm walking into my bedroom to spend time with my wife oh god i plead the blood of jesus christ down upon our marriage so that we might have time together with no regrets as I'm sitting down at the table with my kids and my family, and we're getting ready to eat, and you know family time can either make you or break you. Oh, God, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ down upon my family time. May we have family time with no regrets. It's a powerful verse. Because here's the thing. My son and I, we've, we've talked about this for, man, since he was seven or eight Joshua recognized early on that pride was his biggest enemy. And so for 18 years, we've talked about this. And we both searched, and we've cried out, and we've begged God, how do we, how do we get rid of the pride in us? Because it, it affects everything we do. The only prescription I've found for pride is the blood of Jesus. It's the only thing that can free your marriage, that can free your children, that can free this church from pride and arrogance is that. So do me a favor. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Every head bow. Every eye closed. we got some things we got to deal with. There's more than I wanted to say, but God told me that I can't say any more than this because if you don't get this right, then it doesn't matter what I say. Come back next week if you want to hear the rest. But my first question is this, every head bowed and every eye closed. The reason why I'm doing this is because, again, you know this. Most of you are regulars. You know I'm asking you to bow your head and close your eyes. Just listen to the sound of my voice. Why? Because you need to, some one-on-one -on -one time with God. Because, you know, it's real easy to talk about and tell everybody you're a Christian. It's real easy to convince yourself a Christian until we start talking about judgment. Standing before a holy God that you cannot lie to that knows you, that knows the truth. Maybe nobody else in your life knows, but he knows. And some of you right now, I'm, 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 I'm asking you, are you ready to be judged? I mean, it's, it's going to be bad enough for the Christians, but man, what he says, what terrible a fate awaits those who do not get saved. Are you ready to be judged? Because, again, I'm going to be judged, but it's not going to be for heaven or hell. It's going to be whether I get rewarded, and it's going to be whether I have a good job in heaven or not. If you have never been given a new heart and a new life, by the way, there's the key. Are you listening to me? How do you know if you're truly saved? Has there been a moment where you were once one way and now you're different? Has there been that time? By the way... Your, your, your spouse should know, your parents should know, your brother and sister should know, everybody should know. And I have a feeling everybody does know except you. You just won't admit the truth. Has there been that time where you once were one way and now you're different? I've got teenagers that have been coming to this church since they were in the kids department and I don't, I've never seen them different. And so I'm praying for them like they're lost. I'm treating them like they're lost. Are you ready to be judged? 
Because if not, then the Bible says you've only got one choice. You can do nothing and go straight to hell and be burned forever and ever and ever. Or you can call upon the name of the Lord. Admit your, your sinfulness. Admit your pride, your arrogance. Admit your, 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 your depravity. And just say, oh God, I know I don't deserve it. Oh God, I know I don't, you don't, it, I, I'm, I'm asking for mercy. I'm asking for grace. And I know I'm asking you to go against what your grandmama told you. I'm, oh, I'm asking you what you're going against what your parents told you. But if you're not saved today, if you died right now, and you aren't ready to meet a holy God, then you need to do something. You see, there's only one response. And, and I've, I've tried to find one better, but I've never found one better than the one my mama gave me. Because, see, my mama understood the depravity of humans, how bad and desperately wicked we are. And so when people would ask her how she knew she was going to heaven, her answer was always the same, because God promised me. He said, if I called upon the name of the Lord, I would be saved. He would give me a new heart and a new life, and he did. And if you ever knew my mama, you knew that she once was one way, and then she wasn't. How about you? Are you ready to just quit trading one addiction for another? And get that new heart. Cry out, beg God for that new heart and new life. This is a prayer he wants to answer. Oh, Lord, let me pray for you right now. Dear God, I... I God, I got people here that you showed me in the spiritual realm. It's about to break my heart because they're going to go to hell. And they're going to go to hell the whole time thinking that they're not. Oh, Lord, break their hard hearts. There's someone listening to this video. Break their hard hearts. Give them the humility to cry out to you and receive that new heart and new life. Lord, set them free from their mama and their grandmama and their grandpa and their daddy. Set them free from anybody that's trying to trick them and convince them that they're saved when they're not. Oh, God, may it just be you and them. And may today be their day of, I once was this way, and now I'm not. God, I pray for that for them. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Whether you're here with us today uh, in the audience or maybe you're joining us by video because you worked in one of our ministries and you're watching a little bit later this week, uh, or maybe you're at home and participating in the service from there, whatever the reason is, we know that God has called us together and that he's given us a purpose to be able to give so that we can expand the ministry outreach and opportunity to build his kingdom. It's a crazy concept that God's given us to be able to grow the kingdom of God, that he comes to us. You see, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns everything. He is the creator. But he's given us a system and a plan whereby we give based on what he's given us. And our tithe is 10% of that income that comes in. And those of us who identify with Freedom Family Church, we're responsible for giving of a tithe so that we can go out into the rest of the world, so that we can make an impact and a difference in community. And we've been doing just that at Freedom Family Church. God has been so good to us. And the community has, um, as a result, been blessed by it. We've been able to expand our ministries and wonderful things are being done. But that's only because of your obedience. It's because of your obedience to God and your tithe. And then over and above that, we encourage you to give an offering, whatever the Holy Spirit lays on your heart to give. Now that offering sometimes is given in church on Sunday morning, but oftentimes throughout the week, it's the offering that's given because you're sensitive to what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life, how you're able to help others. At this time, as we come into the end of the year and the holiday season, a lot of times we think about the needs of others and how we can give. We would encourage you to be generous, to be generous and to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in your community as you have opportunity. It's really simple to give. We've, made, we've got several ways for you to be able to do that. In just a moment, the ushers are going to walk by with um, buckets for you to be able to place your gift in, the, in that offering bucket. We encourage you to participate and just touch the bucket, even if you've already given online. Because you can go to our website and give online. And if you go to freedomfamilychurch.org, it'll take you to a giving location where you can type in your information to be able to give. If you also want the text to give, and, and about 70% of our giving comes in through text to give. 
And if you want a text to give, you simply text that number that's there available for you on the screen. If it's your first time doing it, you'll be led to our website to enter some information. But once you set it up, you can simply just put your dollar amount into text to give that's how you can give consistently each week or as the Lord lays on your heart to give. We say this not for those of you who are visiting with us, but for those of you who identify with Freedom Family Church. If today's your first time visiting with us or you're a visitor here, we didn't ask you to come here so we can take your money. That's not our goal. That's not why we're saying this. But we believe very strongly that an obedient heart is a giving heart. That obedience is important for our success. And I don't know about you, but God promises a great promise in the Bible that I want in my life. And that is if I will be obedient in my giving, if I will test him, he will prove to me that he will open up the windows of heaven and pour out so much more than I can ever imagine. So this morning, we're going to be obedient together as a family as the ushers prepare to come. You join me in praying for this offer. We're thankful that we know that you are the creator of all things and that you give us good things. And so this morning, as we go into this time of offering, we ask that you make us submissive to what you would have us to give, starting first with our tithe, with our 10%. Thank you for blessing us with jobs. Thank you for blessing us with income and the opportunity to give back. And then I pray that you would speak to our hearts about an offering, about a gift that you would have us to give here or throughout the week as we meet needs. Lord, bless those that give. I pray that we would truly see the windows of heaven open, and see your blessings pour out on us because of our obedience. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.